Okay. Good day, everyone, and welcome to State Machine. Before we get started, just a couple of uh, logistic notes. If you have any question, uh, there's the Q&A panel uh, from WebEx, or you can drop them into the Slack uh, channel for the conference room free, or feel free to ping me directly on Slack. That's not a problem at all. I'll, make, I'll do my best to get back to you as fast as I can after the talk. So, when I was young, so it was around 1989, I didn't have a driver license back then, and I was 16. And uh, with friends, we used to go to Milan to clubs to attend concerts. That night, uh, the concert was uh, Red Hot Chili Peppers. And they weren't that famous yet back then. And we weren't really interested in the, the band at all. So we were going to these uh, kind of clubs uh, just because those clubs back then allowed to do stage diving. <laughs> and even if it, I still like to go to concerts, and I would love to be able to stage dive again, regardless of the security problem that there's now, my age doesn't really allow that anymore. But anyway, so back to the to the topic here. So if we were to go to a concert today, what we need to do is basically two things. The first one being buying tickets. So and the second one, obviously stage dive, well, go to the concert. From our perspective, uh, going to the concert uh, is basically a one single operation, just buying the tickets, right? And then attend the concert itself. But if we try to look at the concert from the perspective of uh, what they want to do, so the, the company or the group of people behind the concert organization, what they have to do is basically keep calm and make money. That's their main goal, right? And in order to do that, what they have to be able to achieve is, first of all, they have to be able to display available tickets. So some sort of website or a phone you can drop a call to, to tell me how many tickets do you have available. And then allow me to reserve tickets. And once tickets are reserved, charge my credit card, obviously. And once the credit card has been charged and I paid, ship tickets somewhere. And the interesting things of these operation and many more, obviously, because if you think to a company selling tickets online, they probably sell gadgets as well, and they want to track marketing related information. So what kind of concerts people look on the website, but they don't end buying tickets, so they want to track user actions on the website. So one important thing to notice about these kind of operations is that uh, sometimes uh, the order doesn't matter, and sometime it does. So let me tell you a couple of stories. So a few years ago, I went online to an e-commerce uh, from a very large and famous uh, device manufacturer, and I bought a device. And that device, uh, I, put, I put it in the shopping cart. I, I did the entire checkout process, uh, and finally, I submitted my credit card and hit the checkout button and pay button, right? So I received a nice email saying, well, your order is on the way. We'll get back to you as soon as it's shipped. And generally speaking, what happens with, with this large e-commerce web shop, for example, like Amazon does, is that your credit card is generally charged only when the order is shipped, not at the exact moment when you buy it, but when they ship the, the stuff to you. So in that case, what happened is that a few days later, I received another email saying, your order is on its way, enjoy your device. And literally a few seconds later, a text message from the credit card company saying, operation denied. So I immediately said, well, it's eventual consistency, right? So the email went out, but they're not really shipping anything. Two days later, the shipping courier showed up at my place saying, hey, here is your device. And meanwhile, for two days, the credit card company was texting me saying, 
Oppression denied, oppression denied, oppression denied. So basically what happens is that they were trying to charge my credit card, but they were constantly failing while the device was traveling to my place. And I even called them. So I called the customer support saying, hey, I, I, I got this, but I haven't paid for it. And the, the, the lady on the phone told me, yeah, you know, you know, I can see that from my CRM thing, I can see that you got the device and you haven't paid for it because we failed in charging your credit card. But you know what, from the process that we have, if it's shipped, it's paid. So there's nothing I can do, enjoy your device. Okay, thank you very much. And that's an interesting point, right? So we assume in this case, at least, that paying must happen before shipping. Is that always the case? Not really. Let's take, for example, highways in Italy. And I guess the same happens in many countries where you pay for highways. So when you, when you enter a highway in Italy, there's a gate and uh, you get a ticket, right? So when you exit the highway, there's a, you, you can do that talking to a human or to a machine. You insert the ticket and then you put in your credit card and the, the gate opens and you just go. Your credit card is not charged synchronously as you exit the gate. So basically what they are doing is that uh, they charge your credit, they just capture credit card information at that time and the ticket information that you just put in and they later on try to charge your credit card. They assume it will work. So they're basically saying uh, commands won't fail. And uh, other than assuming that it will work, they're basically saying, well, usually the amount to be paid is so small that even if we fail in charging the credit card, it doesn't really matter. It happens so unfrequently that missing a couple of customers doesn't really matter. It happened to me once and probably 25 years. So the, the, the funny thing was that uh, I was traveling from Switzerland back home to Italy and uh, my credit card was cloned. So it was invalid. And by the time I exited the gate in the highway, what happens is that they captured the information and later on they tried to charge the credit card, but obviously the, the credit card company denied the transaction because the, the card was cloned in the meantime. And they never came back to me. So. They're basically the same kind of thing, right? We're paying in both cases for a service. Well, in the first case, it was a device, but essentially we're paying for something. In the first case, the order is truly important from their process perspective. In the second case, the order is doesn't really matter. So they prefer to prevent a possible queue at the gate because if something goes badly, basically you have cars queuing up at the gate because they cannot get out and they prefer to optimize for the successful case instead of risking of cars queuing up. So let's go back for a second to our uh, ticket buying system. And let's imagine what could be a very naive implementation. So the first thing we said, we need to show tickets. So we can call something like display available seats and we get back a list of seats or tickets, whatever they are. And then we say, well, let's take two. So we, we, we cannot reserve seats, so we just grab two tickets. So we have two selected seats or two selected seats, and then we try to reserve them. So we call the reserve seats, and what we get back is a reservation that probably contains a reference to our tickets. And finally, well, finally, along the process, we try to authorize the credit card. So we authorize the credit card, and if the authorization succeed, then what we try, what we do is basically we charge the card and finally ship tickets, right? That's the, the process that we described, because we want to make sure that uh, before we ship, uh, we actually succeed in charging the credit card. The authorization process is just to make sure that are there money enough on that credit card? So. One of the, the, the interesting thing of this naive implementation can be as much complex as you want, right? So, but it's essentially this kind of process that you wanna design. So one of the problems of this kind of implementation is that um, these are probably remote requests. So we're talking to sort of payment gateway to authorize the card. And we're talking again to a sort of payment gateway to charge the credit card, given the authorization that we received back before. And 
we're talking to probably the shipping courier website or web API, whatever, in order to request the, the, the shipment, the pickup of the tickets that need, to, that need to be shipped. What's the problem with this kind of remote requests? Well, the first one is not really problematic, right? So if something goes badly, we just abort the operation. What happens to the second one? So we have we, we, we basically want to orchestrate in some way across two operations. Now, if we have only two operations, what can go badly is that uh, the first one fails, the charging of the credit card, and we're fine. We just roll back in some way everything and tell to the user something went badly, just retry, whatever. You, you haven't bought anything, your shopping cart is now empty, and we're fine. But what happens if the second one times out? So the bad scenario is exactly that uh, the HTTP request succeeds, but we don't know because the response times out. The response never come back. So basically, we're now in a sort of uh, unmanageable state because we have no idea what the scenario is, right? So when we, when we deal in such a sequential process with remote requests, we're always exposed to this kind of behavior. And uh, the, the fact that we, we, we really feel the need of wrapping this into a sort of transaction is a sign that something is, it, that something is a smell. So usually what happens is that uh, the first approach to solving this problem is to turn this kind of naive implementation into what, it, into, into what it's generally called a process manager. So process managers, and I'm, I'm, I'm using process managers not necessarily from the domain-driven design world. So, so bear with me and we'll see what I mean by process manager in this case. So there's a kind of overlap with DDD, but it's not necessarily the domain driven design kind of concept. So we said that we need to select tickets, right? So the ticket selection process talks to reservation in order to select tickets. And we have a request response with reservation saying, hey, how many tickets do you have? Please reserve me, reserve two for me. And then we have a, an information that says, well, the user wants to check out. I spell that in a event kind of thing, so order check it out, but it's not an event yet, so we'll get to that later. What's the checkout intent kicks out is the order management process. That's the real process, right? So what we do is that we reach out to the credit card, gateway, anti-corruption layer, it can man Happy. It, can, it can have many names, but it's basically a payment gateway that allows us to talk to the credit card provider. And one of the important things to notice is that it's a still request response, but we're doing that using a message. In this case, it's exactly a message on a queue. So we're moving away from remote requests as remote procedure calls into a queue. So the reservation one is still, might be still a remote request that is handled over a, an RPC kind of approach. But now we're moving to a remote request over a queue. And then we talk again to reservation, again, this in this kind of RPC kind of style. And then again, we go back to the credit card saying, okay, charge the card now. So we authorize data, we confirm the ticket uh, to reservation, and then we charge the card. And finally, we talk to shipping. So basically what we did is that we isolated remote requests into its own processes, talking to them through a queue. We haven't really solved the original problem. So what might go wrong is that Let's use the same sample before. So we send out the message to shipping, the shipping gateway. The shipping gateway talks to the shipping courier API through HTTP again, and the response doesn't come back. What happens is that the process manager, the order manager, never receives a response message. So now the order manager isn't in doubt anymore. Shipping didn't happen. So I know what to do now. I can roll back 
whatever it means from this kind of process, the entire process, and tell to the user, we failed in shipping. There is no doubt yet. So there is no doubt anymore. Well, there is doubt, but that doubt is confined into shipping, and shipping could have said to the operations team, hey, I'm having an issue. And the operation team comes in and try to fix the issue. But from the process perspective, isolating the doubt into its own separate process, or call it an endpoint, where we can do just one single operation allows us to solve the problem of the need of dealing with remote requests that can fail. But we haven't solved all the problems, right? So we still have some sort of orchestration is still required. Because if we, if we fail in shipping, we need to roll back the, the, credit, the transaction with the credit card. So there's this still this chat happening between credit card and shipping. But the fact is that orchestration is not the only issue we should get rid of. Let's try to have a look at the process manager from the storage perspective. So let's imagine a very simple orders manager where we have an order table that contains an order ID, a shipping ID, a shipping status, and many more columns. So there will probably be a payment ID and the payment status and the number of tickets and so on and so on and so on. So now let's imagine that someone comes along and says, well, you know what? We, during the weekend, we were at the golf field playing golf and we realized that a ah, very interesting feature could be allow people to collect tickets at the venue instead of shipping tickets at their place. So we have a new requirement now that is collect tickets at the venue. And the problem is that if we look at this kind of schema, collecting tickets at the venue as an issue, there's no shipping, right? So now it means that shipping ID and shipping status doesn't really represent the full reality of the system. So one option is that in order to support this kind of new thing, we have to make shipping ID and shipping status nullable. But that collides with the fact that from the high level perspective of the code, we cannot really deal with that because what does it mean if there's no shipping ID? So if it is null, does it mean that there will be no shipping because it's collected the venue or because there hasn't been shipping yet? So we need to change the scheme again, adding a third column that represents the fact that kind of shipping, so the shipping type, other than the shipping status and the shipping ID. So it's, this kind of thing is basically telling us that the process manager is not that different from a punch card. And when the business come along and say, hey, we have a new requirement, that new requirement should, goes, should go there. So basically, if... Um, if we picture a process manager like a punch card, what happens is that in order to fit a new requirement in a very special place, we have to throw away the entire punch card. There isn't much that you can do, right? So we cannot really put ourselves there and fix a hole in the punch card, change some numbers, and try to fit the new requirement in. So it's going to be a mess. Not to mention that it's very easy that if we picture a very complex process, like uh, buying tickets online could be, because what we picked are a very, it's a very simple use case. So if you picture that uh, real world process, it's very easy to view a process manager like this. So what might happen, obviously, is that uh, the more features you add, the more the process manager becomes the big ball of mud. And it's easy to see what the problem is, right? So we have tickets sitting there in the middle, the big ball of mud now are tickets. And then we have all the services or all the actors trying to do something with tickets, like charging their credit card because tickets represent an order. And now there's insurance saying, I need to insure, make sure that these tickets are delivered and I'm paying an insurance for these tickets because they are for the La Scala Theater in Milan and they are 400 bucks each ticket, right? And then we have marketing trying to do stuff with tickets, and then we have shipping trying to do stuff with tickets. And by the way, there's customer care down there. 
you can barely see it, but well, we're Italians, right? So customer care doesn't really matter. But anyway, so there, there are all these services trying to do stuff with our tickets and they are fighting with each other. That's why we need an orchestrator. So there's this guy sitting there looking at all these people fighting for tickets, trying to do stuff with the tickets, and you can see your code and your processes and your threads doing stuff with the tickets, and the orchestrator that acts like a semaphore or acts like the distributed transaction coordinator in an attempt to make order in the entropy. So there's a lot of chaos going on and the orchestrator is sitting there trying to fix stuff. And by the way, there are two guys, a lady and a guy sitting over there, back then, back there. And who they are? They fail over. Because obviously, if you have an orchestrator and uh, it fails, then you need replacement for the orchestrator, right? So you need to have someone sitting there doing nothing just for the problem of the orchestrator failing. So the both the naive approach and the process manager approach, even if the process manager approach by using messages to decouple some of the temporal coupling between actors in the system, they can be seen as fragile. First of all, they violate the single responsibility principle. So in both cases, we're doing too many things. We're reserving tickets, we're charging the user credit card, we're shipping stuff all in a single place. They're a single unit of deployment. So when someone comes and says, I need a new feature, we need to deploy the entire stuff. So they're mon in, in, in being monolithic, they cause a problem to the operations team because they have to deploy everything every single time something changes, even if that something is very tiny. If we're dealing with a large code base and we're using these kind of approaches, then we'll start having conflicting changes and merge conflicts. Because that's a given, right? If they are a single unit of deployment, probably they all live in the same repository and we have multiple teams touching the same code base or at least multiple people touching the same code base and start changing stuff they should not really change and causing problems to other people. And they might be a contention and performance bottleneck. Because it's obvious that as soon as we have a performance problem, we have to scale up or scale out everything. We cannot really focus on what do we need to scale out. Is the problem the, the charging of the credit card? Is the problem the, the tickets reservation? Doesn't really matter, right? So we have to scale out everything just because it's a single unit of deployment. The reality is that there's no spoon. Well, there's no process manager, sorry. So what can be really tricky in these kind of scenarios is talking to domain experts. So if we start analyzing these kind of processes, blindly trusting a domain expert, they'll start talking about the order management system. That's natural because that's the way they view things, right? So, and it's super easy, super easy for the, the engineer that is always in the back of our mind that as soon as they say the word, uh, well, we have an order management system, we picture that as public class order management system. And they say, we, have, we, we can reserve ticket, public async task reserve tickets. And, things like that. So we, we, we immediately transition from what they talk about to a sort of design. And the thing is that that leads very easily to a monolithic kind of thing, because that's the way they describe things, but they're describing a user mentor model. They're describing the way they picture a user doing their main process that is selling tickets, right? When we listen to them, we should be carefully listening to the words and the nouns and the verbs they use and try to chop it up. So what we really want to do is try to isolate things that should not stay together. Because our, our final goal, our final destination in some way, is that we want to have autonomy in collaborative domains. So we, 
in, we, we, we started all this journey by saying uh, we have three actions, four actions to do, right? List tickets, reserve tickets, deal with payments, charge a credit card, authorize the credit card, ship tickets, and finally stage die. But that's another problem, right? So think about when you, if there's IKEA in your country, but at least it is in mine, right? So whenever you go to IKEA, you can you you enter the shop, you you walk around, you pick up stuff, you 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 make a note where uh, in the warehouse uh, stuff that is too big to be picked up uh, while you're walking the shop is, uh, and then you reach the the cashier, you pay, and then it's up to you to decide: uh, should I try to fit everything in my car? Oh, nice! There's the shipment desk over there. Let me go to the shipment desk with my order and tell them, can you ship this stuff at my place? That's it. IKEA doesn't really know anything about that shipping thing. They don't care. And the shipping <laughs> thing doesn't really care about what have you done inside the IKEA shop. They just care about the, 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 the list of things they want, they, they need to ship. And if you have the list of things, huh, they assume you have paid. Otherwise, you cannot have the list of things. So it means that um, they, they don't care what happened at the cashier. You might have paid with a credit card. You might have paid with uh, cash. You might have paid with a uh, check, whatever. But from their perspective, it's not relevant at all. So the, the, two, the two domains we're talking about, the IKEA furniture shop and the shipping thing that happens to live inside the same shop, they are completely autonomous from each other. One is feeding the other, so there's a kind of dependency between the two, very similar to the device thing we talked before, but they are autonomous. There's a very limited amount of information that needs to flow from one domain to the other, if any, in order to allow the second one, in this case the shipment, to ship stuff at my place. And if we want to transition that concept into architecture, we can't really do using a process manager. Because if you think about, there isn't anyone when you're walking inside an IKEA shop watching over you, like, <laughs> like, a, like a kind of a crow that flies over your head and says, what are you doing? Oh, he picked up this, he picked up that. Let me, let me add it to the, to, the, to the bill. And while I'm here, let me try to charge their credit card and see if there's money. That doesn't really happen. There isn't really anyone orchestrating that, right? So you're walking into the shop, you, you reach the end, you're at the cashier, you pay, and Technically speaking, you're even allowed to go away and leave everything there. No one cares, right? So when we want to model that as an architecture concept, we can use sagas. So sagas are designed to achieve autonomy in collaborative domains. And let's start by defining what sagas are. So the, the, the best definition I've found of, of sagas is basically sagas are multiple workflows, each one providing compensating actions for every step of the workflow where it can fail, where it can fail. Let's try to dissect this uh, definition. The first bit is multiple workflows. And you probably already envisioned that, right? So we talked about reserving tickets. We talked about charging credit cards. We talked about shipping tickets. So we can transition this to sort of reservation, finance, and shipping. Those are the free domains or free subdomains or free services or free microservices, call them as you will, doesn't really matter in this case, that we're dealing with. And if we, if we try to dive in and try to picture out what the process could be, here is what could look like. So we have available tickets. So in some way, we displayed available tickets on, on the website. Let's say that there's a website. And then we can select tickets. And we select tickets, and we do that using a reservation. And selecting tickets means that we're going to put tickets, let's say, into a shopping cart. Fine. Then when we're happy with the ticket selection, then we start checking out. At this point, 
reservation is not really interested anymore, right? It's like if we are at the cashier. So we reach the cashier and we have some stuff in the shopping cart and maybe some stuff on a list of things that we, we, we want to pick up later at warehouse, but we have stuff in the shopping cart in some way. So what we do is reservation check it out because we are at the cashier. At this point, the bowl or the hot potatoes goes to the cashier. That, that is finance, right? What finance does is do something with our credit card and tell to reservation, you know what? The, the, the payment has been authorized. There's money on the credit card. And by authorizing the payment, we locked that money. So that money is available to us. That's not necessarily true, but we'll get to that later. At that point, the reservation can say, well, I'm happy, so here is an order for you. So here is the, 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 the checkout list. That is the thing that you can later on use to go to shipping, right? So finance says payment succeeded because we already locked the money on the credit card. And now that we have these two information, so we have uh, the pickup list and we have uh, the payment receipt, we can go to shipping or the shipment desk at a, in the IKEA shop and do our stuff with them. So ship stuff at our place or ship tickets in this case, if we are still talking about delivering tickets. So what do we have here? We have free workflows because you can imagine that inside these big boxes, there are many things happening. So they are workflows in some way. So they, they are state machines. The shipping, for example, it's all well, the finance, it's even easier. The payment is being authorized. It's the state where the payment is. And then when it transition to another state, it's going to be payment successful or payment failed because something might go wrong. Shipping as well. It's the shipment has been prepared. The shipment has been delivered. The shipment has been sent or has been received by the customer. Here is the customer signature. and so on. All these workflows, they basically participate into the tickets ordering saga. So the saga is the relationship between these workflows, right? And to be honest, we prefer in particular software to call them policies instead of workflows. Why? Because they make sense from a businessman perspective. So stakeholders, they don't understand the word workflow. So it's much better to talk about payment policy or shipping policy or the reservation policy, right? So it's much easier for them to understand what you're talking about. So it's, sharing this kind of common lingo is a way and is a nice way to enrich and augment collaboration between different groups. And for... <clears throat> If any one of you have already been to an event, in an event storming masterclass, I've done one with Alberto a couple of years ago, you can probably already see what I'm aiming to. That is, these four events, reservation check it out, payment authorized, order created, payment succeeded, are what the event storming people call pivotal events. So a pivotal event, is an event that allows the entire system, in this case, the tickets reservation saga, to a transition to a different state, right? So if you, you probably can imagine that inside finance or shipping itself, there's many things happening. So there are many events that are not relevant at all from the outside, who cares? What's important are these pivotal events or what in the SOA world we call pub sub events. These are the things that are cross boundary or cross service kind of information that flows around the system to allow the system to transition from state A to state B and state C and maybe back to state B, whatever the process it is. Let's now have a look inside the black box. So what's inside these sagas or what's inside each workflow? Let's start again from the available tickets. We go to reservation to select tickets. We 
put tickets in the shopping cart and then we proceed to check out and we do that again to reservation. Reservation publishes the reservation check out process that goes to finance that initiate the payment process. Right, so here is the payment workflow starting. And the first step of the payment workflow is to send out a message to the payment gateway that talks to the credit card provider saying, hey, can you authorize this credit card with this amount for me? And if that succeeds, there, there will be a payment authorized event that goes back to reservation that creates the order that publishes, sorry, the order created event that again, is interesting for finance, might be interesting for other people as well, like marketing, for example, that is interesting in knowing how many cards convert into orders. And finance goes back to the payment gateway saying, hey, charge this credit card for me. Here is the, the previous authorization ID you gave me. And finally publishes the payment succeeded that goes to shipping as the order created one. And finally shipping talks to the courier gateway saying, hey, can you send me shipping courier because I need to send tickets to a customer. Is that more complex? Given the naive approach? Sounds it is, right? But it's not really. So what we are doing is simply letting the complexity emerge. We haven't changed the process at all. So the process is exactly the same process we were trying to design using the naive approach and the process manager as well. But now it's clear where the complexity is. So we, we, we simply let uh, the complexity emerge and be clear from the process design perspective. Now let's go back to the requirement that we got previously. So collect the tickets at the venue. And if we have this nice process, uh, where we have multiple workflows collaborating with each other, and we, we claimed this autonomy in there, right? So collecting, ticket at the, at the, collecting tickets at the venue is something that should affect shipping only. So that's the only thing we should be able to change, we have to change in order to allow at the venue collection. Let's see if it's possible, right? So we said that uh, shipping, in order to be triggered, needs both order created and payments succeeded. What we can do is basically change the shipping policy to, and augment it saying, what's the delivery mode? Is it collection at the venue or ship at home? So if it's not collection at the venue, so it's ship at home, we're doing the same process before. So we're sending a message to deliver courier, they will come pick up the tickets and deliver them. We're fine. If it is collected the venue, then we're sending a message internally to shipping. So there's, there's another branch happening here that is store for venue delivery. And what happens is that there's another policy that starts that act like a kind of a batching collection policy for every event that there will be. So there will be store for the venue contains the ticket IDs and the event ID. And there will be one batch shipping at the venue policy for every future event. So that ship, that batch shipping policy will collect tickets and when it's time, they'll deliver them. So once one of these two operations happened, what we can do is that we can consider the original shipping policy as complete. So from the outside perspective, shipping is done, right? So if we immediately shipped going on the right side, so there's no collected the venue, but it's ship at home, we're fine, we're happy, it's done. Tickets are on their way. If we decided to store for venue delivery, someone else, the batch shipping, the, the shipping at the venue policy have picked up and collected those tickets, well, stored them in in the, in the batch that need to be shipped in the future. So we don't need any more the original shipping policy that can be considered done. We can even publish an event like shipment completed. Hmm? And now we have this long living policy that sooner or later will decide to ship tickets. We'll call a courier, give them a batch of tickets and that courier will do, they, they, they will do their job and once they're done, they reply back saying, we're done. 
tickets are there and then can kick off for example marketing saying uh, we need to send an email to all the customers that decided to collect tickets at the venue in order to let them know how to collect them when the when the day of the event will be and at that point this sub workflow quote unquote can be considered completed but from the outside who cares right so no one knows that we changed the entire process inside shipping to accommodate new, new, this new requirement. Reservation doesn't care. Finance doesn't care at all. Other parts of the system might not care at all, right? The second bit uh, of the definition was uh, each one providing compensating actions for every step of the workflow where it can fail. Let's see what kind of failures we can have. Let's say that when payment authorized is raised by finance, reservation fails. And reservation fails might be a bug. So in processing that message, there's a bug that makes a reservation go nuts or a reservation is down, so it's not available. So it's not really a failure, but no one processes the message, right? So what happens is that the order created event is never published and Finance never charges the credit card, and the payment succeeded event is never published. And that means that shipping does nothing. So the interesting thing of, the, of this kind of uh, single responsibility principle application is that now a very simple failure in one part of the system is fixing stuff for us in some way. <laughs> because nothing happens. There, 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 there isn't the need of having an if somewhere saying, has a reservation failed? Oh, yes, I don't need to ship. Because the simple fact that events are not published makes so that the shipment never happens. But we have a problem, right? So we authorize the card. Ha. What's the problem with authorizing the card? Well, it's not really a problem, right? So if you've ever been to an hotel, especially in the US, for example, what they do is that they authorize your car when you check in for inc incidentals. So they're basically saying, you're going to stay here a week, uh, here is a thousand bucks charged on your card, authorized on your card. So that money is blocked off. You cannot use the card anymore for that amount of money. And they do, they do nothing when you check out. Why? Because at the end of the month, uh, automatically the credit card provider will uh, discard authorizations that haven't been converted into a, a payment, right? So they don't really care. We can basically do the same thing. So we could say, who cares? We, we authorized the card, nothing happened. Sooner or later, the, the authorization will be released. Or we can decide to be some sort of a polite with our customers and try to compensate the problem. So let's see what we can do. The problem obviously lives in reservation, in finance, sorry, because we, we published the payment authorized, but we never received the order created event from reservation. That means that we have no way to process the second step that is charging the credit card. The first question, and that's a very interesting temptation, is do we need reservation to publish a sort of a failed event? And it's very tempting to say yes. I'm very sorry to say that that's coupling. So whenever we ask someone else, outside of our boundaries to change their processes in order to accommodate one of our needs, we're basically causing coupling. It's not code coupling, it's not binary coupling in this case, it's a sort of process or business coupling, but it's still coupling it is. So, and as we said before, reservation might be down. So if reservation is down, it won't process the payment authorized event and it won't be able to even publish a reservation failed event. So still we won't receive anything from reservation. What can we do? Well, there's an interesting thing that we can do. So whenever we authorize the card, if that authorization succeeds, what we can do is that along with publishing the payment authorized event, we can set a timeout. In this case, I'm saying set a 40 hours, 48 hours, sorry, timeout to release money. What's a timeout? It's a message to ourselves. 
we're basically asking the system to, hey, deliver me back this message in 48 hours. Can be 48 seconds, can be 48 weeks, or whatever, whatever the process dictates, right? So 48 hours later, what happens is that the message comes back, it reappears in the queue. And what, what finance can do is ask itself, did I receive the reservation event? The reservation, the, the order, check it out, or the reservation tell, told me something. If the answer is no, we release money. That's it, easy peasy. If the answer is yes, we do nothing. We don't need to do anything. Why? Because in the meantime, it means that reservation came back to us with the order created event. So finance already, finance already charged the credit card, published the payment succeeded event and marked this process specific to this order as completed. So the timeout fires and expires for a process that doesn't exist anymore. So we, we're happy again, right? The, the, there isn't really nothing that we need to do. Before going ahead, let's dive a little, dive a little bit sorry, into what a timeout is. Let's try to picture that in, in, in code. Uh, so we said there's the reservation check it out event that is handled by finance. And on, on the left side of the screen, you can see the, the finance code. So what finance does is sends out an authorization request that goes to the payment gateway. The payment gateway handle, handles the authorization request, authorize the card, talking to the credit card provider, and reply with the new authorization response, uh, providing the authorization ID, assuming that the authorization response means that it's succeeded, right? <laughs> And uh, we're back to finance, where finance receives the authorization response and says, well, I'm going to publish the payment authorized event and in the same transaction, I'll get to that in a second, I'm going to request a timeout for 48 hours so that uh, someone will get back to me in 48 hours. When the timeout fires, then we can simply check a Boolean saying, was it reserved? Yes, no, and do whatever we need to do based on the process. There are a couple of things I'd like to highlight here. Single responsibility principle at its maximum. So we're sending out a message to do one single operation. And if that operation is not uh, idempotent, so we cannot really do, let's say, let's imagine that we cannot really do authorized card multiple times because the, the third party we're talking to is not that important. We're going to do this one single operation only once. And if it fails, we do nothing. Or we can reply or publish an event authorization failed or whatever, and just stop the process and wait for a human to come in and probably pick up the phone and call the credit card provider. Hey, what happened with this transaction? And secondly, these two operations, the publish and the request timeout, are transactional. Most of the transports or the queuing systems provides a way to have a sort of transactional dispatch to the queue because both the publish and the request timeout are messages that will be sent to the queuing system. And the publish is going to behave like a regular message that, for example, on RabbitMQ goes to an exchange and then is broadcasted to, broadcasted to subscribers. And the request timeout, it's a delayed delivery that goes into the native delayed delivery infrastructure of RabbitMQ and is then resurrected into the original queue when the timeout expires. But they have to be transactional. Otherwise, we're back to the problem of what happens if the publish succeeds and the request timeout fails. It can be a huge problem. Let's have a look again at the what happens to the table schema, because we highlighted this as a problem, right? When we were talking about the process manager, the main difference between using a process manager from the storage perspective and using sagas or multiple workflows is that we're basically splitting responsibilities at the storage as well. So we can now have uh, each uh, service, manually, subdomain, microservice, whatever you want to call them, we can let them have their own storage 
that can be even different technologies. I'm picturing stuff here if they were relational tables, but there is nothing preventing finance to use, MongoDB shipping to use, SQL and reservation to use, whatever, Cosmos DB on Azure, doesn't really matter. The only thing they care about is that they are, sh they are sharing the same conceptual primary key. So everyone contains the order ID and is order ID primary key that represent the, the order that's coming in from the checkout request process is basically shared across all the services. But the important thing is now that everyone can evolve, can evolve independently. So if we try to fit the requirement of shipping tickets at the venue here, we still need a schema change in the shipping table, but that's not going to be a problem for anyone else. So we, we reach autonomy, we reach the autonomy at all the levels. We're basically cutting the system instead of only horizontal layers into vertical layers. That's why I like to call them vertical slices. Each slice, reservation, shipping, and finance is completely isolated from all the others. And they are just talking to each other using those pivotal events or pub sub events in order to communicate state changes to the other actors in the system. So let's recap a little bit uh, what Sagas brings to the table, what Sagas bring to the table. The business process is distributed now. So we have many parties participating into the business process. As we pictured out, we have finance, reservation, and shipping, each one of them respecting the single responsibility principle. And if we wanna be even more um, prescriptive, we could say that inside each one of them, we can have many workflows, like we talked about when we introduced the, the new feature in, uh, in, in shipping, where we had multiple workflows again inside shipping, each one respecting the single responsibility principle doing one single thing. The evolution is not conflicting anymore, and it's simpler. We have independent units of deployment, and we have independent scale out units. So that's it. that's the important bits, right? What, what sagas bring to the table. Obviously, in the interest of time, I have no time to run a demo, but there's a demo available that shows all this running with multiple processes starting up. It's built in .NET Core and it's available on GitHub. Here are the links to the demo. And by the way, here are the links to the slides. They're already available. And if you wanna hear Udi Dahan, that is my boss, by the way, talking about sagas, you can go to that link and there are a couple of hours of video of Woody diving into what sagas are. So let's do a quick recap. Pitfalls first, because obviously we don't have silver bullets, right? So we've seen that in transitioning from the naive implementation to the process manager to sagas, we gain something at every step. And, but what's the problem of sagas? Well, the main issue of sagas, it's a, I, I don't really define that an issue as an issue, but the, the most important thing we need to think about is that now the state is distributed. So we need to monitor the distributed state and that might be problematic, right? So let's, let's try to picture yourself at the, on, on the phone with a customer saying, where's my order? and you have to look into multiple storages in order to be able to rebuild the order status and understand what's the status of the order. Whether on the contrary, in a process manager where there's a single table and in the naive approach as well, there's probably a single table where everything is stored, it's super easy to understand what's the problem, right? And uh, so as soon as we started distributing and trying to fit in autonomy into the system, we'll obviously get something back. That is all the advantages that we listed, plus a pitfall. In this case, that's the fact that the, the state is distributed. So, but what are the main takeaways? Behaviors define how to design processes, not data. So follow the coupling and not the data. Listen to verbs and not to noun. Listen to events and not to noun. 
data are a kind of side effect. We need to store data somewhere, but the thing that is important is which kind of processes are touching which kind of data. So it's the process boundary that defines which data should be in those boundaries. And uh, everything else that is not touched by that process is not needed in there. And once we have identified processes, we can chop them up and start calling them services, microservices, and defining boundaries or bounded context, or whatever kind of architectural approach style you're using. And the second one is that use delayed messaging to model time. Instead of coming up with batch jobs, for example, to let's, let's go, let me go through the entire database of millions of orders we've received to see if uh, someone hasn't paid. What can possibly go wrong, right? So what we can do is basically for every transaction, like we did, for example, for the credit card, we can send ourselves a delayed message saying, hey, check this transaction. Was it paid? Yes, otherwise it is money. So we can model every single kind of, this kind of interaction using delayed messages to make decisions in a synchronous world in the future. And the last bit that is probably the most important one, there is no such thing as orchestration. And that's really, really important. Most of the times, there's no need for an orchestrator. There's no need for someone or something overarching the entire process. There's no need for a process manager. We can always model this kind of the relationship between autonomous components in a system to model what a business process is without any need of building any orchestrator. I, I usually tell people, whenever you think to orchestration, think to coupling. And coupling is bad, right? Not necessarily. We, we can talk about coupling later, but that's not the, the point of the talk. But it, orchestration is not really needed. We can model every single process using autonomous components that can talk to each other using just events or state changes and putting in, in and setting up compensating actions in order to overcome two problems that they might face while dealing with the process itself. So my name is Mauro Servienti. I'm a solution architect at Particular Software. We are the makers of a service bus. There's a few content information you can reach me to. And thank you very much. It was a pleasure. If you have any question, obviously I'll be available uh, in Slack uh, or in the QA window now, I guess for the next uh, five minutes, because then there's the next speaker coming up. Uh, or ping me directly, I'll be available for the next couple of days. Um, I'll be around for the next couple of days and you can reach to me even privately on Slack, no problems. We can even set up a call if we want to discuss face to face that it's much better than text. Thanks again. <laughs>